afternoon, YouTube viewers. I'm here again to share the word of God with you. The topic we will be looking at is the stumbling block of iniquity. And the study today will be centered around chapter 14 of Ezekiel. And before we go any further, I'm going to say a brief word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ and his righteousness that saves us from sin. And we ask that as we seek for clearer understanding of your word, that you'll send your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. May you bless the listening audience and all the viewers and everyone who is tuned in to this study. Bless us now and may you guide every word which proceed from my mouth in Jesus' name. Amen. Self-deception is the worst kind of deception a person can encounter. When a person tries to deceive another, it can be understood that that person has a spirit of evil attached to him or her. This spirit causes the person to mislead others. In the book of Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says that Satan is a deceiver. He is one who deceives, one who leads into error. He is an imposter. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 says, he deceives the whole world. We can See that also in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 and 4, where it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, as God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, he shall not surely die. As we clearly see here, God had commanded Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree in the midst of the garden, not to touch the fruit either. But the devil came subtly and said, Yea, as God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. God said to the woman and to the man who was Adam, that the day you eat of the fruit of that tree, you shall surely die. And here the devil came and deceived the woman, causing her to eat of the tree. And she took, she gave to her husband, and man sinned. And man was chased out of the garden. And as a result, we have a world that is fallen and in a state of corruption due to sin. Global sins brings global judgment. National sins bring national judgments. And as we look at our topic, the stumbling block of iniquity, we will see that in chapter 14 of Ezekiel, that iniquity has caused men to be separated, to be estranged from God. God used the prophet Ezekiel to minister his word to his people who were in captivity. They were in exile. Apparently, from a cursory reading of the book, the people were walking contrary to God's laws, his ordinances, his statutes, his precepts, and judgment. They were practicing wickedness, idolatry. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5 says we are to examine ourselves if we are in the faith. He says, know ye not yourselves except you are reprobates. The word reprobates there mean evil, wicked. The word examine 
means to inspect carefully with a view to discover truth or the real state of a thing. Secondly, it means to search or inquire into facts and circumstances by interrogating as to examine a witness. So here Paul is saying, we as a people of God, we need to inspect ourselves. We need to carefully inspect with the view to discover the truth or the real state of who we are. If we are in Christ or if we are not. Because he says, according to 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, if we do not know ourselves, we are simply reprobates. We need to know whether or not we are in the faith. We need to take a careful look, do some introspection, look at our life, look at our walk with the Lord and see if we are walking according to his laws, his precepts, his statutes and his judgment that he has laid down in his word. In Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 1, I'll start to 3. He said, then came of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? So the elders, as the scripture here says, came to the prophet Ezekiel. But the interesting thing and the thing which I see jumps out at me here is that before these prophets, these elders rather, could utter a word to the prophet, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet. God revealed to the prophet the condition of these elders, these leaders of his people, the state that they were in. And he, he, that's God, showed, he revealed to Ezekiel that these men were treacherous. They were evil, wicked deceivers. They came and took their seats before him. They, they, they were idolaters. Their idols were not physical graven images. They were not made by men's hands. The people could not see them. Neither could the prophet see them with some physical images, graven images, worshipping. They were invisible. Only God and themselves knew they existed. They were spiritual idols. They set them in their hearts. These men were crooked. They were winding out of moral conduct. They were devious, forward, perverse, going out of the path of rectitude. They were wandering from their duty. As we see in the law of God, that God took 70 men and placed on them the spirit that was upon Moses. And so we see that the elders were supposed to stand and judge the people in righteousness. They were to execute justice at the gate. But these men have become wicked. They were in captivity and, and this is one of the chief reason they were led into captivity. They were worshipping idols in Israel, in Judah. And these idols, because of the worshipping of these idols, they led to all manner of abominable practicing, every form of vice and wickedness they committed. 
the, the Bible even goes further to say that they exceeded the wickedness and the sins of the people of the land who were before them, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Philistines, the Jebusites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, you name it, the Hittites. And so as a result, God sent his prophets to warn them, to turn them from the path of destruction and moral degradation. But they refused. Some of the prophets they killed, others they stoned, and, and, and the rest they did all manner of evil to. And God put them in captivity, sent them into exile. And even though they were in exile, they still were worshipping these idols. These idols were left back in Judah. They were in Israel. But these men were still worshipping these idols in their heart. These elders were to judge the cause of the people of God. They were to stand in the gap. But they were saying one thing with their mouth and another by their thoughts and actions. When they came to the prophet, God gave a word to the prophet. In verse 1, he said, Should I be inquired of at all by them? In other words, these wicked, deceitful, religious renegades, why do they come to hear from me? They already have other gods before me. God's law in Exodus tells us that we are not supposed to have any other gods before him. In Exodus chapter 20, and we'll read verse 1 through to verse 6. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And verse 6, and, uh, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. These men, these elders, these leaders, apostles, pastors, bishops, whatever you may call them in today's word, these so-called leaders of God, these people came to Ezekiel with their gods. The scripture here said, idols, to inquire before God, the creator. Listen to me and follow closely. The men came to manipulate God and his prophet. In other words, they came and said to themselves, I'm going to see if he's going to get a word from God. We are not worshiping this God of his. And he said he's a prophet of God. Let us see if he knows what is in our hearts or what we are doing in secret places. God who is omniscient knows all things. Even before it happens in the physical realm, God sees it in the spiritual realm. I will let you know, my listening audience, God does not manipulate and neither can he be manipulated by anyone. He said that we should not have any other gods before him. 
according to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3. And he said, no graven images, no likeness of anything in heaven or in the earth or in the waters or under the earth. And we should not bow ourselves to them nor serve them, for he is jealous. But these men had iniquity in their hearts. They had the stumbling block of their iniquity in their heart. They were idolaters. And verse 6 of Exodus 20 says that God shows mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. But according to verse 5, he visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. In verse 3 of Ezekiel 14, God says these leaders have placed a stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Their iniquity is that which causes them to stumble. A stumbling block is something that causes one to stumble, to fall. They can't walk. They can't see where they are going. It's in their faces. That's what God says. So they can't see. And there's a blockage right in front of their face. And what is this blockage? It is the iniquity. Their iniquity. And it causes them to stumble. They cannot see spiritually. They are stumbling because of their iniquity. The obstacles that they have, it, it, it handicapped them. It was an impediment, a blockage, a barrier from them going forward. And it caused them to stumble. Things get quite interesting in verse 4. I said, therefore speak unto them. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. God said, speak to them, Ezekiel. Tell them, every one of them who set up idol in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquities before their faces and come to the prophet. I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitudes of his idols. So, based on your iniquity, Based on their iniquity, the many idols, multitude suggests a great many, a great number. God says he's going to give them a word based on the multitude of idols, based on the magnitude of their sins and iniquity. He will answer them. He will give them a word. It will not be the prophet. The prophet is the oracle. God is giving the prophet the word to speak to them. But God is saying that the word is not just coming from the prophets. It's not of his own imaginations, his feeling, or his thought towards their wretchedness or their wickedness. But God is going to give the prophet the word to speak to them. So God is saying, it is not a prophet, not the pastor, not a bishop, not an apostle, but he himself will answer you according to the great number of idols which represent false gods and that which takes the place of him, the supreme creator and God of the universe. An idol is anything which usurps the place of God in the hearts of his rational creatures. 
So whatever you might have in your heart, taking the place of God today, that is an idol. Whatever you put before God, whatever takes first place is considered an idol. And these men had many idols. The Bible said they set up idols in their hearts. An idol is also anything on which one sets his or her affections. That which one indulge an excessive and sinful attachment. So whatever sinful attachment or indulgence one might be involved in, you love to party more than worshiping God, you love to eat, you love to drink, you love women, you love men, you love money, you love material position, whatever you put before God becomes your idol. These leaders' affections were sinful. Pride, lust, greed, covetousness, murder, hatred, you name it. Their hearts were filled with these things. In the epistles to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul in chapter 5 and verse 19 onward says, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19, but now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So all these were in the hearts of these leaders. They were evil and wicked. And according to the scripture, they cannot inherit the kingdom of God with idols in their heart or with such evil things. The Bible in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 says that we are to mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So, the Bible here in Ezekiel chapter 14 said, These men have set up their idols in their heart. Now, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 tells us that fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, they are idolatry. Idolatry. God here is telling the prophet, you just stand back and let me deal with them. You are just seeing some elderly men, well-robed in fancy suits. You see outwardly as man sees, but I read the heart. In verse 5, part B of Ezekiel chapter 14, God says he's going to trap them in their own heart because they are separated from him to their idol. Now God entreat them to repent. God is saying, turn ye from your wicked ways. For as long as I live, I have no death in the death of the wicked. We read that in Ezekiel 
chapter 18 and onward, God says, as long as he lives, he have no pleasure in the death of him that died. He's speaking of eternal death now. He's not just speaking of the physical death. God is saying that you need to repent. You turn away. The word repentance in the Hebrew word shove, which means that you are going in one direction and you will make an about turn and go in the opposite direction from which you are coming from. That is repentance. God entreats them to repent. In verse 6, God said to Ezekiel, Repent, turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. God says in Exodus 20 and verse 3 to 6 that he will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation to them that hate me those who hate God God is going to visit the iniquity of your being upon your children unto the third and fourth generation there is much disputation as to what this actually means whether it's just unto the fourth generation, some scholars will say it is unto the seventh generation. So whether it be unto the fourth or the seventh generation, God is going to visit such iniquity upon your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and even great-great-grandchildren. But I love verse 6. He says that he shows mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keeps his commandments. Question, are you loving God? Are you keeping his commandments? I'm not just talking about the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, which makes up the moral law. I'm speaking of the entire Bible. Are you just taking out what you think is relevant to your life and what you think is applicable. I'm here to tell you that won't work. The Bible says all oh, scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You find that in the book of Timothy, chapter 3. Verse 15, 16. So that's Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. So you can't just accept a portion of the scripture and discard the rest because it conflicts with your creed or your doctrine or belief or your way of life. The Bible says all scripture is given by God and it came by his inspiration. And it's profitable. That means it's good for doctrine and for reproof and to correct you and to instruct you in righteousness that you may be perfect and truly furnished unto all good works. So when you follow the scripture, the Bible says that you will be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God is saying that people Put away the idols from your hearts. Put away that which take your affection away from him. All the things that alienate you from him. Put them away. For I the Lord, thy God, I am a jealous God. According to Exodus 20 and verse 5. And if somebody is jealous, trust me, they are going to visit you if what? You belongs to them and someone else you are paying homage to, that person is going to do you something. Are they going to cut you off and not deal with you anymore? In Ezekiel 14 and verse 8, God says, I am going to set my face against you. 
I will make you a sign and a proverb. God setting his face against you means that he's going to turn his back upon you. You're going to be left alone. God is going to reject you. And when God rejects you and you are left on your own, then the demonic, the evil spirit, Satan, is going to come and take up residence in your life. And that will lead to utter destruction. He says also, he will cut you off from the midst of his people. And then you will know that he is Lord. There is only one Lord. And that is the true and living God. All others are idols. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is Lord. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9, 10, and 11, he says, Wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For I, the Lord thy God, I am a jealous God. Jesus says that he is Lord. Who is he? He said he is Lord. He rules over all. Every knee shall bow. Whether you are fat and you have a fat knee, you will bow. Whether you are slender and you are skinny, you are bow. Whether you have healthy knee or skinny, every knee will bow. And no matter what kind of tongue you have, Pierced tongue, unpierced tongue, long tongue, short tongue, fat tongue, or even if you have a short tongue, you will have to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that is to the glory of God the Father. Jesus says that you are under his control and command. He is supreme. He has all power and authority. He is ruler and governor of the whole earth. In verse 9 of Ezekiel chapter 14, and I'll read that in your hearing. And the prophet, and if the prophet be deceived when he has Spoken a thing. I the Lord have deceived that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand upon him. And will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. If the prophet is deceived. God is going to destroy him. I'm telling you. There are many false prophets in the world today. God did not call or send them. They are self-proclaimed prophets. Self-appointed. Everyone these days are most are receiving visions of God. God has a message. God spoke to me while I was on my way in the car. While I was coming here, God gave me a revelation. God is giving revelation. So many people receiving revelation. But Jesus warned his followers about them in these last days. In Matthew 24 and verse 24, he says, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophet, so that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. In other words, the scripture is telling you that the elect of Christ cannot be deceived by these prophets, but they will deceive many. And you can look on the television and the televangelists, how many prophets are among them and they are all re receiving prophetic revelations. 
and they have a message for you. The Bible says you need to be careful of them. False prophets shall arise and deceive many. So here we see God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel, telling the leaders of his people what their hand will be if they do not repent and also what will happen to the false prophet who speak under deception. He said he's going to destroy them from the midst of the people of Israel. And today, we might not be under a theocracy as the children of Israel and Judah were, wherein God was the supreme leader. They did not have a president or a prime minister, but the word of God was supposed to be the laws that they follow and they were to live according to the word of God, the Tanakh. The testament, as we would call it. And so, if they did not turn from their evil ways, God was going to destroy them. But they had what was a stumbling block right before their face. And this stumbling block was iniquity. It wasn't just sin, missing the mark. But it was an upgrade from missing the mark that they were practicing wickedness which needed the punishment from God. They were constantly doing this. They did not just fell into sin and acknowledge their sin as Psalm 51 said and, and repented of it. But they continued to do this and God hates idolatry if he didn't he wouldn't have put it in his word to say that you must have no other gods before me you should put nothing and no one before me it gets pretty much serious Very serious. From verse 12. Onward. In verse 12 it says. The word of the Lord came again to the prophet. I'll read from the Bible. The word of the Lord came again to me saying. Son of man, when the land sinned against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it and will break the staff of the bread thereof and will send famine upon it and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, say the Lord God. If I cause nigh some beasts to pass through the land and they spoil it so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beast, though these three men were in it, as I live, said the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Verse 17, or if I bring a sword upon that land and say, sword, go through the land so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, say the Lord God, they shall deliver neither their sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Verse 19, or if I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast, 
do not what Daniel and Job were in it. As I live, say the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Verse 21. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and the famine, and the noisome beast, and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. I'm here to let you know, just as it came, as before it came again. The word of the Lord. This time it was not about the elders or any one individual. But concerning the land sinning grievously by trespassing against God. You see, Israel had sinned against God. It wasn't just a family or an individual. It wasn't just a tribe or a community. Of believers within Israel who sinned and trespassed. We see that when they do such things in sinning against God. God punished them according to the law. That was in the, the civil law. The ceremonial law. The moral law. Or the health law. They would have been punished. But the whole land sinned. And we see here that national sins result in national punishment. And so it is in our world today, global sins result in global punishment. Right now, as I speak, we are still under lockdown from this pestilence, COVID-19. And it is causing a lot of pandemonium in all parts of the world. People are getting frustrated in being locked up in their homes, can't go on the streets. People are tired for these months of being in self-isolation. But God is saying that the land has sinned grievously. When the land sins grievously by trespassing against him, not against man, but against him, in other words, the whole nation, not just a family, a city, a province, a town, a state, but the whole nation. Sin has gone nationwide. And today, sin has become global. This was done grievously, meaning it was with pain, with a great pain or distress, atrociously, with enormous cruelty or guilt. So. They weren't just missing the mark, but they were practicing sin. They practiced sin until it seemed or became as if they were practicing righteousness. Look around you. Look at the news. Read the headlines, the tabloids, the newspaper. Listen to the radio. Watch the television. The wickedness done to our fellow men. They teach that God is dead. The question I would ask, who killed them? They enslaved their fellow men and women who gave them the right to do that. They trafficked their fellow humans. Who ordered that? They murder, they rob, they oppress. There are wars with no accountability to anyone. They mistreat the poor and has no regard for justice. This kind of reckless living and crimes against God has gone global. No nation on earth is exempted. Listen what God is going to do. I am glad. That God sees all, knows all, and that is all powerful, and none can hinder him. 
He says in Psalm 121 verse 4, He that keepeth Israel neither slumber nor sleeps. So you who are practicing wickedness, if you think God is asleep, you need to check the scriptures because the scriptures are the words of God. In Psalm 138 and verse 2, it says that God places his word above his name. So if the Bible says he does not sleep nor slumber, you are malfunctioning and automatically you will become a failure to believe that what you are doing, it goes unseen. The holy angels take record of your everyday life. Everything you do, everything you say, every word, every action, every deed is recorded. And that will be used against you in the judgment. It will be used against me as well in the judgment. And so the Bible says today, if you hear his voice in Hebrews chapter 4, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. As they who were in the wilderness provoked him to wrath and were destroyed. I am glad the scripture declares also in Acts 17 verse 31. He has appointed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness. So there is a judgment coming. And I want to let you know if you are outside of Christ you will be doomed. He that believeth. In Christ should not be condemned, but he that believeth not is already condemned. Read John 3 and from verse 16 on to the end. God is going to judge you and me. You cannot bribe him or buy him. There are those in this world who think that because they can manipulate the justice system, that they can do just the same with God. Many have been deceived by religious rascals. They think that they can pay some money to a priest, to an apostle, to a prophet, to a pastor, and they walk into eternal bliss. But I'm here to tell you that you have been deceived. There's only one way, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So there is one way. You cannot have Jesus and Buddha, Emperor Eli Selassie, you cannot have Vishnu, Brahman, and Krishna. You cannot have the one over 3.1 million gods of the Hindu pantheon, plus those of the Romans and the Greek, and all the other nations. And think that you're going to go to heaven. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. If it's in the word, it must be heard, and you need to hear it. And if it's in the book, the holy book, you need to take a look. Don't just take what I say, but search the book. John 5, 39, Jesus says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, for they are they which testify of me. So I'm here to let you know that the scripture testify of Jesus Christ, his love, his mercy, and his grace. In Isaiah chapter 53 it says that he was wounded for transgression, and by his chastisement we have peace. It tells you that he was bruised for iniquity. 
and all our sins were laid upon him. And by his death, his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, we can have life and have it more abundantly. He even says in his word, He that believeth in me, though he dead, yet shall he live. And he who is alive and believes in me shall never die. I'm telling you, my friends, my listeners, those of you tuning in to this study, that if you trust Jesus and trust your life to him, he will save you. God says he's going to judge us. And he says it, I believe it. He says he's going to break the staff of bread. He's going to send famine. He will send all these catastrophes upon the world. Look around the globe. Look around the world. He said he will cut off man and beast. People will die. Starvation. Watch the world news and listen to your radio. In verse 14 of Ezekiel chapter, he tells the people that though these three men, Noah, Daniel, Job, were in the land, they can deliver no one by their righteousness. When the inhabitants of a land have filled up the measure of their iniquities and arise to and, and, and God arise to execute judgment, the few righteous that are left cannot by their prayers and intercessions deliver the nation from the judgment that God has decreed against it. Many want to live as they please. And they don't know that by doing so, they're just going to die like trees. God says they shall, they will, but deliver their own self, their own soul. My righteousness cannot save you. Your righteousness cannot save me. It cannot save anyone. When I speak of my righteousness, I'm speaking of the righteousness of God, which I am in Christ Jesus. Because Isaiah says all our righteousness is as filthy rags before him. So when we take on Christ, we take on his righteousness. And when we take on his righteousness, <coughs> excuse me, that righteousness cannot save anyone. Noah, though he was righteous, was able to save his family. A total of eight people. We know the story in Genesis. The whole old world perished by the universal flood according to Genesis 8 and verse 21. And we see in Daniel chapter 9 where Daniel interceded on behalf of the Jewish nation and received a promise of the restoration to a vision. In Job chapter 42 and verse 8, we saw Job prayed for his three friends and offered sacrifices for them. And God accepted Job's intercession in their behalf. However, when God's irreversible decree has gone out against a particular nation or nations, not even the prayers of such men as Noah, Daniel and Job will be effectual toward their deliverance. For it is only for those that have not arrived at that height of wickedness that the prayers of the righteous avail it much. In Jeremiah 15 and verse 1, God said unto the prophet Jeremiah, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, Yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight. In other words, God was going to destroy them. This, uh, this is an eviction notice. One of death and destruction decreed against a people he loved and favored. 
God says he will appoint four kinds over them. The sword to slay, the dogs to tear, and the fowls of the air, the buzzards, and the beasts of the earth. National sins equates to national punishment. Just as individual sins equates to individual punishment. And a family sins equate to family punishment. Citywide sins equate to the city being punished by God. And so it is with a state. God will punish that state. Global sins equates to global judgment and so it is national sins equates to national judgment or punishment this is all a result of the leaders of god's people deviating from god's principles laws and statutes leading them into apostasy they have become so corrupt that god had to destroy them in verse 15 to 23 of Ezekiel chapter 14. There's a repetition of verses 12, 13, and 14, but with different forms of punishment. Here also God says, None can save the wicked, not even the prayers of the faithful, such as Noah, Daniel, or Job, if they were among them. Will you heed the Spirit's voice today? God says, Today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation in the wilderness. You find that in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, 2 to 16. And this is my final text as I seek to wrap up this study. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 to 16 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Verse 16 and last, for some when they had heard, did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. So we said we need to take heed, and while it is today, we need to believe and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We need to trust him. We need to exhort one another daily. We need not to harden our heart through the deceitfulness of sin. And we know sin is deceitful. And as one of the opening scriptures that we've read of Revelation 12 verse 9 says that Satan deceived the whole world. And in chapter 3 of Genesis verses 1 and 4, we saw how he deceived Eve in eating of the fruit from the tree in the midst of the garden where God said, do not touch or eat of it for the day you do such, you shall surely die. And she took and she ate and the result we can see it all around us. Not just physical death, but many have gone into eternity only to be resurrected in the second resurrection spoken of in the book of Revelation, to be cast in that lake which burned with fire and brimstone with the wicked and with the devil and his evil angels. So what the Apostle Paul is saying, we can escape that if we accept Christ, if we believe in him and if we depart from evil, the deceitfulness of sin, 
and hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So in other words, we need to persevere unto the end in Christ Jesus. You know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that the race is not for the swift, nor the battle for the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, but time and chance happen to everyone. It's not how long you've been a Christian. It's not how long you've been walking with the Lord. But he that endure unto the end, the scripture says, the same shall be saved. Jesus says, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. As the people who did in the wilderness and said, we wish we had died in Egypt. And God said, yes, you are going to die here in the wilderness. And they all died. Only their children went over into the promised land. Only two who left Egypt went into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. I am here to tell you, and I hope and trust, that the stumbling block of iniquity that we are having in our lives in our hearts that we will get rid of it and don't be like these elders who came before the prophet of God and sat down and thinking that God does not know that they have iniquity in their hearts. Idolaters, idolaters rather, they were worshipping idols inwardly. Outwardly, those idols were left in the nation of Israel and Judah because they were led into captivity. So they couldn't take those physical graven images with them. But they have worshipped them outwardly in their nation and now they worship them in their hearts. God sees the heart. As he told Samuel, man look at the heart. He said, God does not look as man looks, but God looks at the heart. God is seeing your heart. He's seeing my heart. I hope and trust that when he looks at our heart, we will have a heart that is transformed in the renewing of our mind. As Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 states, may God bless you and may you tune in next time for the next study. Culprits in the pulpit exposed. God bless you all. Let us say a word of prayer. Father, as I pray, I ask that you will send your Holy Spirit to lead all those who are listening to your light. And I pray that you will send your holy guardian angels that you have assigned to each one of us to protect us from Satan and his legions and even the Antichrist. Lord, give them your truth, Lord. I pray that you will wash them from all their sins and wash them as white as snow. Lord, your word says in Isaiah 1 verse 18, Come now and let us reason together. Say the Lord, though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Lord, may you wash them white as snow. May you wash our hearts and may they be white as wool. In the blood of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.